everyone and welcome to another episode of the Bootcast. We're now on to the final episode of Series 3. We're on episode 12 now. And just a quick thank you to anyone who has tuned into the Bootcast at all, ever, whether you started listening, you started on the journey with us back over a year ago now with Shane Trainer, the All Right Traveller in Season 1, Episode 1, or you joined anywhere along the way. We've had some amazing guests on the show, some brilliant insights um, into travel, into adventure, into mental resilience and um, improving mental health, overcoming all sorts of challenges, people from all over the world. And uh, yeah, it's been a brilliant, uh, brilliant journey up to now and looking forward to getting started with season four in a couple of weeks time. So just a quick thank you once again to everyone and um, thanks a million for watching or listening and following along, supporting in any way that you can. Really appreciate it. if you could leave a review or rating wherever you do listen to your podcasts, that really helped me. Thanks a million. So moving swiftly along, Today's episode takes us to Donegal in Northern Ireland where we talk to Ian Miller of Unique Ascent. Unique Ascent offers outdoor activity and training, particularly in hill walk and mountaineering and rock climbing. And obviously sea stack climbing as well, which is on the more extreme end of rock climbing, I guess. Delighted to have Ian on the show where he shares his experiences, some life-defining moments and what it was like to fall from a 60-foot drop into the sea. So without further ado, folks, please welcome Ian Miller to the Bootcast. Ian, thanks for coming on the show. Hi, uh, man. Hello. And so tell us a bit about yourself, who you are and what you do for a living. Yeah, my, my name is Ian Miller. I, uh, I live in Don, Donegal and I'm a, a full-time sea stack uh, rock climber. Uh, I have as much fun as possible on a day-to-day <laughs> basis. <laughs> that would be, that would be the, the short version. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and just for anyone who, who might be listening or watching, so sea stacks, can you kind of explain what what a sea stack is well if you imagine a, a, a straightforward cliff face and over time the sea especially the west coast of ireland west coast of scotland where predominantly sea stacks are, are prolific you have a lot of motion coming in big waves hitting the cliffs and when a wave hits a cliff it can trap air in cracks the air compresses and pops bits off and these bits that pop off creates peninsulas. The peninsulas start to collapse, which creates arches. The arches collapse and leave towers. And it's these towers that I kind of seek the summits. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, I was watching some of your videos and stuff on your website. And even, even like, it looks to be a challenge even to get out to the sea stack. So in some cases you're going by rope or maybe in a, little boat or raft um like does does much does much planning need to go into it's very very similar to alpine mountaineering and in alpine mountaineering before you even consider what you're going to do you've got to suss out what the weather's been doing what the snow conditions are just in general an awful lot of things you like to know for me and replace the the snow and ice with the sea so Every single time I'm out, it's it's an endless process of elimination of where not to go, basically. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, the planning preparation is is easily 60, 70 percent of a of a of a day of play. Jeez. And how, how did you get into this, or like, have you always been into mountains and rock climbing? And did it kind of was it kind of a natural progression? Did you need to get a bigger buzz or? <laughs> No, the way the way it usually works with all with all like adventure sports is that most people begin with for for rock climbing it, a few years ago, twenty or so years ago, you were a hill walker first, and you spent a lot of time hill walking up and down hills, up and down mountains in the UK and Ireland, and then as you progress in your hill walking, and still being in your twenties, you tend to say, okay, I want to go steeper, and there's a point where steepness needs a rope. And as soon as you start needing a rope, you then progress just by a process of gaining experience to using a rope for technical rock climbing. Uh, with a mountain background, hill walking background, it's just a, a natural progression. Yeah, very good. What's what's been your biggest biggest challenge to date ever? Oh, the, I there's been a few. Yeah. There's been a few. Uh, I free soloed some a uh, thing called Croc Namara. That that took a lifetime of experience to do that. That was that was in hindsight mildly foolish, but it yeah. did take a lot of experience to to, to 
to get that done. Yeah. But I've also taken my five-year-old to places where uh, I'm not going to say a five-year-old shouldn't be, but where with an awful lot of preempting mm. situations, yeah. it's safe enough to take a youngster. Uh, yeah. So it's a big. I also I have also played out with a lot of times a girl called Nikki Bradley, who uh, is a permanent crutch user. Uh, so she's been to a lot of places where. Yeah. You could say she shouldn't have been, but she was with the right. We mm. made the right plans, you know. What I mean, the, the, and the plans worked. So <laughs> it's multi. In fact, every if you're taking people out to do something in which, if something goes wrong, potentially there's going to be a fatality. Mm. And if the people you're taking out have got no previous experience of rock climbing, then every day you cannot become complacent. So every day, I my my only assumption is that I'm going to have a fatality every time I go out. So I've gone out this afternoon to do something. I'm go- I assume I'm going to have a fatality. Jesus. So I'm already preventing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's a pretty wild mindset. <laughs> Surely is. Jeez. <laughs> and it must be amazing. Like it must be an amazing accomplishment for like someone who's um, a permanent crutch user to, to do something like that because you know, you're every everyday person who has all of their limbs in, in perfect work and order mightn't want to or mightn't believe that they can do it like yeah it's i think i think to use the analogy during lockdown there an awful lot of people were re, were discovering the area around their house mm. i never realized i had all, all this in my doorstep yeah, yeah. so you find a lot of people who are able-bodied and have time before you know it they haven't really done what they wanted to do because they always could yeah. And a lot of people that come to me are doing things because for one reason or another, they want to do it now. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's when something's you only you only miss your central heat when the central heat's not working, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's what's been your favorite moment in your in your career to, to date? I I was at, at the base of a thousand foot cliff in a child's inflatable dinghy, about 750 metres from the exit point, which was a storm beach. You have to scramble down almost abseil to get onto it. So totally committed in this five-foot child's inflatable, and an orca breached about 20, 25 foot from us. That was a pretty special moment. That was was, uh, about 12 years ago. Uh, (laughs) it's, It's difficult to define because... If you were to ask me what my favourite rock climb is or what my favourite day out was, I can only answer that by saying it's the next time I go out. Yeah. Because if I've if I've already had my favourite day out, best, you know what I mean. So I always I always think I'm going to recreate the, the orca moment at any yeah. time. So that's, every every day, every day is different, but every day is pretty good. You know what I mean. That's, that's a good way to to look at good perspective to have, um, especially now. You know, people need to stay kind of thinking that their best days are ahead of them yeah (laughs) and just on that like how how do you deal with like the like mental challenges whether it's out on the rocks or just kind of anything and it's you know especially with the lockdown i think it challenged a lot of people's mental health and that kind of thing how do you deal with that like you cannot you cannot uh, change what you can't control and you don't go and do you don't do anything that when you, you cross the T's and dot the I's before you leave the house so if I'm going to go and do something then everything I can possibly do prior to leaving the house like two days before I'm checking the sea forecast I'm checking the frequency of the wave height I'm checking what's happening weather-wise over the last few days, what's happening over the next few days, just so that I'm picking the right weather day and the right sea day from crossing sea mm. before I even start. So by the time I get to paddled out the base of the, to say to climb an unclimbed sea stack, mm. I already have a prediction of what everything's going to that's going to lie ahead. Yeah. I maybe have gone to the stack and looked through binoculars. So I, I've crossed as many T's as I can so that I'm actually leaving as little as possible yeah. un, un, unchecked. You can't have you, you can't have good fortune. You don't want to use good fortune. Yeah. 
Yeah. Some, somebody wiser than me once said that you were born with two jars. One's full and one's empty. One's your luck jar and one's your experience jar. Well, my luck jar's empty. And I'm, I'm playing <laughs> purely off the experience <laughs> jar. So Jeez, yeah. how you deal with it is you don't want to be fighting. You'd rather be marching. So to keep marching, you plan meticulously. And if things do go wrong, then you dip into your skills jar. But usually when you're dipping into your skills jar, something's something's just not quite right. Yeah. Good, good, good solid advice. So just on that, do you do most of these feats? Are they solo or would you have someone maybe doing it with you or as a backup or helping you with the ropes and stuff? Or how does it? No. If, I, if I'm going to go and do something and I don't need someone else to be there to actually do whatever it is, mm. then I go alone. And my, my reasoning for that is that me and you went to do something. We've now increased our chance of an injury by 100%. Yeah, yeah. If there was two of us, if there was two more, then I've increased. We've all increased our chance of having an injury of fatality by another 200% because I've got two people with me. And if they're not needed to be there to, to do whatever we're doing, then I go alone. And it's actually much, much safer. Mm. Jeez. <laughs> Ian, whereabouts are you from, actually? I, uh, I'm, I'm well, from Scotland, obviously, but from, yeah. from Orkney, from the, from the nar- far north is where I came from to, to Ireland. Okay. Just some info then on learning to climb. Like, so you mentioned kind of hill walking is where you'd start off if somebody wanted to then moving on to mountain climbing, then rocks and then the sea stacks. So if people wanted to get involved with doing something like this or like going to you for, for your expertise, how would they, how would they go about that? Well, I say to, I say to, to most people, if you can get to an indoor wall, so say you're Dublin based or Belfast based or Cork based, they've all, all those three places have got good, really good indoor facilities. Yeah. And if you're not already a hill walker, then go into an indoor wall and book in an induction. A two-hour come and try it with an instructor on that wall is a great way to say, just to, am, I, am I going to like this? Because rock climbing or pulling on plastic indoors in the indoor walls is physically pretty similar to outdoor climbing. And, that, and then the two sports diverge and they're totally separate sports. There's, there's very little that, that joins the two, apart from the fact you've got the same equipment, everything else is different. So for nowadays, going to an indoor wall is a great place to start. Okay, good stuff. With the lockdown and everything, there's lots of staycations happening. And as you said before, people are starting to kind of see what's around them. And maybe in some cases, it's only within one or two kilometers that they didn't even know was there um, from their home. So like, where would you where would you say is kind of your top top three places in in Ireland for just scenery and like breathtaking locations? It's 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 well documented now about the coast, the west, especially the west coast, but the entire coast of Donegal. Uh, you get you get to the west coast of Ireland on a beautiful day, and you're going to have a holiday that it's comparable to anywhere else you would go. Yeah. Uh, I tend to think of, of the west coast of Ireland in terms of adventure capitals of the, of the world. You've got west coast of Ireland, you've got Canada, you've got uh, New Zealand, and you've got Switzerland. For me, there's no difference between these places. They each have unique and outrageously world-class facilities for yeah. playing out. There's very few places in the world you can swim a bit Baskin sharks after climbing a sea stack. You can watch the Northern Lights. You know what I mean? It's yeah, it's yeah. it's endless. Uh, it's it, it's it's a case of wherever you go, you're going to get beautiful scenery. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, anywhere yeah. on the West Coast. Brilliant. Do you have any kind of really life-defining moment on on a sea stack, or any kind of story like that where? Okay, about 2008 sort of time, I went to a sea stack called uh, Anne Budgel. It was one of the few in the county that were previously named, or certainly named to the point where they were on Ordnance Survey maps as, as the name. And this Anne Budgel is a 50 metre high stack, it's a twin tower, uh, really quite an atmospheric location, the base of a thousand foot cliff. Uh, 
mountaineering and abseiling to get even to the storm beach facing it. It's still a 300 meter sea passage out to the base of it. And what happens at the base of this uh, Anbujo is you get conflicting tides. So to the north of it is a constriction so that a, a, not, a, a semi-tidal scary, so it only appears at low tide, lives about say eight meters to the north of this 50 meter sea stack. And it forces so much water through that constriction that it, it, it funnels white. So it also meets in the corner of the stack, creates a mini whirlpool. And I, I call it the pounding heart of the ocean because it, it looks like a heartbeat. And on a good day, you'll see the seabed and then there's 30 foot of water. Then the seabed as this heartbeat with the conflicting tides. Anyway, and my, I decided that I was going to uh, solo this and do the first ascent of Anbujul, get to the top of it. No one's ever done it before. Got out to it, got landed on it in an inflatable dinghy and then started to climb up the side of the tower. But I was roped. Yeah. But a long story short, I didn't want to place any protection because it would be quicker to do the first pitch as a solo just roped. Anyway, surprise, surprise, I fell off and fell about 60 foot. Fell about 60 foot? foot. Yeah, it fell about 60 foot and it was it was quite an unusual fall because I expected to hit the water yeah. like horizontal. But yeah. as I was approaching the water, I was actually hit vertical by a wave. So I ended up in the whirlpool upside down. Uh, not a great moment and the only reason I'm still here is because the, the rope I was attached back to the anchor, because I was swirling in the whirlpool upside down, I could feel the kelp hit me in the face hmm. as I went round and round. It tightened around my leg like a tourniquet, so I knew to pull on the rope back to the anchor. Yeah. So as I pulled on the rope, came out the whirlpool, uh, right beside the dinghy at the base of the stack was a what looked like a six-year-old girl. And as my head went under again, I came up and she was gone. Now, I don't know what that means, but it was a moment where, yeah, I'd rather not do it again, if you don't mind. Mm, Jesus, <laughs> but yeah. The, the takeaway from having defining moments is they don't actually mean very much, but what they do is they change the course of what you're doing. Mm. So I changed a lot of my procedures based on having met the young lady just for yeah, a brief yeah. second. And yeah, it was, it was, there's been a few, not near death experience, that sounds a bit dramatic, but there's mm. been a few moments where you just think, okay, that's quite, that's quite unusual. <laughs> you, you, you can't, you can't experience, you can't experience yourself. Well, I can't experience myself. I meet myself unless I go to the edge. Yeah. And when, when you're at the edge, you meet yourself. Yeah. If you know what, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's solid, solid advice for anybody. Jeez, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so if people want to reach out to you, Ian, or follow your, your story and your adventures or book a course, book some training with you, how can they, how can they do that? Oh, either, either on Instagram or on Facebook or on the, on the website. It's all Unique Ascent. Uh, unique Ascent dot, dot IE. Dot IE, yeah. Perfect. Ian Miller, thanks a million for coming on the show. Best of luck with everything and stay safe out there. <laughs> no more, man. No more. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks a million. Bye bye. Bye. And that brings us to the end of series three of the Bootcast, folks. Hope you enjoyed that one there with Ian Miller of Unique Ascent. If you are thinking about going up to Northern Ireland in around the Donegal area and you're looking for some outdoor adventurous activities, Contact Unique Ascent and they will happily help you out with some mountaineering, abseiling, rock climbing or sea stack climbing. And there's uh, something for all members of the family up there. And that's Unique Ascent with Ian Miller. Would really appreciate any feedback you can give me folks on the podcast. So reviews and ratings, likes, shares, comments that you can do uh, wherever you listen to the podcast or maybe you're watching it on YouTube either. Would really appreciate that. I'm looking forward to bringing season four out in a couple of weeks time and if you do have any guest suggestions anyone particularly in the fields of overcoming massive challenges whether it's a physical challenge or a mental challenge or some kind of a bounce back that someone has done in their life i uh, would really love to hear their story and bring them on the show so drop us a, a dm an email or just let me know face to face if you if you think there's someone that's that would be a good fit for the show 
And once again, thanks again. And looking forward to bringing season four out in a couple of weeks' time. Remember, become the journey.